Seeking the truth never gets old, even when it hides in the shadows. Immerse yourself in the world of June's Journey, a free-to-play hidden object game set in the Roaring Twenties. Solve the mystery of the devious gossip spreader and celebrate our 7th anniversary with exclusive events, never-before-seen decorations, thrilling mysteries, and exciting giveaways. The adventure and the gossip awaits. Are you ready for the journey? Download June's Journey today for free on Android or iOS. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point-of-sale system you can trust, or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. So I know that you're all here listening to me for a new episode, but have you watched the new Netflix series, The Worst X Ever? It is nuts. It only has four episodes, but holy smokes, it's insanity. Hairs on the back of my neck standing up the entire time. So your homework for next week is to go check those out and then tell me what you think. Also, of course, one of the episodes will be coming to your ears shortly because, hello, military connection. But TBD. Before I get into today's case, I want you all to know that I have seen your messages about two women who went missing recently. They are both connected to the military community, and as expected, many of you are wanting me to cover those cases. There is the case of missing pregnant military spouse Misha Johnson at a Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. I have reached out to her sister and am pending more information on whether they want me to cover Misha's case. The second story is the case of the missing wife of an ex-reservist. Her name is Mamta Buddha. Her husband has already been charged with her murder, but the whereabouts of her remains are unknown as of this recording. I will do a little more digging on Mamta's case. It's a story out of Virginia, and hopefully I will bring it to you shortly. That being said, today's story reminds me of these two women's cases. It started out as a missing persons case, and they charged and convicted someone of her murder. But even after a conviction, that person continued to announce their innocence, and the woman's body had not been found. Until one day, this person realized he really wanted an Xbox in prison more than he wanted to maintain his lie. Yeah, this is that story. Join me today as I tell you the story of Venus Stewart out of Michigan. Now, let's dig in. Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. My story today begins on the morning of April 26, 2010 in Coldwater, Michigan. It was a brisk spring morning at the house of Therese and Larry McComb. The house was bustling with kids, something that the older couple was not used to anymore. But since their daughter, Venus Rose, returned home after a fallout with her husband, the house was now full again. Venus and her two kids were crashing at the house until the dust settled on Venus's separation. That morning, Therese rushed out of the house at 6 a.m., but not before saying goodbye to her daughter and granddaughters. Larry was still in bed. He was a truck driver and had returned from a late night shift. Larry stayed in bed after his wife left. But then at around 8 a.m., he realized that the house was getting pretty loud. You know how kids can be cray-cray in the morning. Larry got up to see what all the ruckus was about, and he found his granddaughters just being loud kids. But as he looked for Venus, maybe to ask her to have the girls settle down a little bit, he couldn't find her. He asked the girls where mom was, but the girls didn't know. Larry checked downstairs to see if maybe Venus was doing laundry, but she wasn't there. Surprisingly, Venus's phone, keys, and wallet were still inside the house. Okay, it was evident Venus couldn't have gone far, so Larry went outside to check for Venus. But she wasn't there either. 
As Larry made his way back in the house, something caught his eye. Right there on the ground, there appeared to be signs of a struggle. Limestone gravel was kicked up over the sidewalk and there were a few bare spots in the gravel driveway that led right to the sidewalk, kind of like when you drag your feet through gravel. As Larry got closer, he saw a pink hair tie on the ground and the plastic wrapper for a recently opened tarp. This was all very strange. Larry immediately sensed that something was wrong. Venus would never leave her kids unsupervised in the house. And why in the world would she leave without saying anything? And especially, why would she leave in her pajamas? Larry immediately called 911 to report Venus missing. Larry next called his wife, Therese, at work. And Therese also felt that something was wrong. Venus was perfectly safe and sound when she left just hours earlier. Even though Venus was a full-grown adult, Therese's alarm bells were ringing. In most missing persons cases, you might have to overcome some incredulous police. But in Venus's case, Michigan Patrol Officer Stizma immediately sensed the seriousness of the situation. As reported by Dateline, Larry showed Stizma all of Venus's belongings inside. He informed him that Venus was in her pajamas, and Larry also told the police about Venus's tumultuous relationship with her husband, Doug. You see, Larry found it odd that just a few weeks earlier, Venus had been awarded full custody of the children, and now Venus was suddenly missing. When Officer Stizma asked where they could find Doug, he learned that Doug lived a thousand miles away in Newport News, Virginia. Huh, that's far. In any event, Stizma treated the outside of the McCombs' home like a crime scene. They cordoned off the area and even requested crime scene specialists come out and collect the evidence. Of particular importance was that tarp wrapper, and at close examination, there was a fingerprint on it. This would definitely be important if tied to Venus's disappearance. While evidence was being collected, Therese called her son-in-law, Doug, to tell him that Venus was missing, but he didn't answer his phone that day. Police gave it a go, trying to contact Doug, and the calls went unanswered, until that evening when Doug answered the phone. Detective Mike Scott had been called in to help find Venus and he was the one who spoke with Doug. Scott told Doug that his wife was missing, and Doug's first reaction was not one of shock, but of disbelief. Is she trying to pull a fast one on everyone, he thought? Detective Scott asked Doug where he was all day, and Doug said he had been in Newport News, Virginia all day. Scott asked if Doug could prove it, and Doug said, yeah, I I can. Earlier in the day, I went to my lawyer's office to pay a bill. Doug said he handed a check to the receptionist up front. Okay, well, even though Doug said he had an alibi, Detective Scott had someone from the FBI check out Doug's alibi in Virginia. Those detectives went in and sure enough, the two receptionists at the law office recalled that Doug had paid a bill that day. And when detectives canvassed Doug's residence, they found surveillance video of Doug leaving his apartment complex and leaving in his car. For now, it appeared that Doug was telling the truth. He had in fact been in Virginia all day when Venus disappeared on April 26. Back in Michigan, the search for Venus was expanding. The news reported a mom went missing. There were ground searches, helicopter searches, and dogs were brought in to search for Venus. Everyone in the surrounding area was on high alert. And then one man came forward saying that a suspicious man, who was all disheveled, wearing no shirt, between 20 and 30 years old, between 5 foot 6 inches and 5 foot 8 inches tall, had been seen between 6 and 8 p.m. and then again at 10.30 p.m. at a nearby lake the night before Venus went missing. The man was soaking wet and asked for a cigarette, according to the Battle Creek Inquirer. Authorities hadn't received any other leads, so they went to that lake and had it searched, but the search revealed no leads into Venus's disappearance. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. This episode was made possible by Every Plate. Are you tired of staring at your grocery bill in disbelief? I get it. Prices are through the roof. But fear not, because there's a game-changing solution that makes home-cooked meals affordable and accessible. Every Plate. 
Enjoy delicious home-cooked meals starting at just $2.99 per meal. What? It's no wonder every plate is known as America's best value meal kit. With every plate, you can say goodbye to grocery store sticker shock. Every plate delivers dependable, affordable, and mouthwatering recipes right to your door. Each box comes with pre-portioned ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes. You can whip up a delicious meal in about 30 minutes, perfect for busy weeknights. And this single mama of three knows a thing or two about busy weeknights. Last week, I was able to miraculously whip up crispy chicken with honey Dijon drizzle and hotel butter steak. I mean, I would never in a million years venture to go to the grocery store to purchase all those ingredients alone. So I consider that a big win. And don't worry, with every plate, you won't get bored. With a rotating menu of 26 weekly recipe options, there's always something new and exciting to try. From comforting classics to adventurous dishes, you'll find the simple recipes that fit your taste buds. This week, I want you to ditch the takeout and embrace the joy of home cooking with fresh ingredients and unbeatable prices. Join the EveryPlate family today and watch your dining experience transform without breaking the bank. Join EveryPlate today and pay only $2.99 per meal on your first box for all box sizes. You can get this amazing deal by using my code MILITARYMAMA299 at everyplate.com slash military M-A-M-A and then the numbers 299. That's code MILITARYMAMA299 at everyplate.com slash MILITARYMAMA299. With every plate, you can taste the difference. In the charming little town of Coldwater, Michigan, Venus Rose McComb was born on August 4th, 1977. Her parents, Larry and Therese, were over the moon convinced their little girl was a goddess sent from heaven. Therese, with all the pride in her heart, couldn't even begin to describe the love she felt when she first laid eyes on her little girl. Along with her brother Dustin and sister Tiffany, the McComb household was a lively place filled with giggles and shenanigans. Fast forward to high school and Venus was graduating Bronson High School as part of the class of 1992. Next up was Western Michigan University, where she dove headfirst into criminal justice with big dreams of joining law enforcement. However, after realizing she had a bit of a dislike for guns, she had to pivot her plans. No worries, though. She landed a job at PNC Bank, where she flourished in the fraud department. So she was still using her criminal justice background. Venus's parents often joked about her trusting nature. It was endearing, but also a bit, shall we say, naive. There was that classic moment when Venus announced meeting a guy who claimed to be in the mafia, only to later discover he was just a fast food employee at McDonald's. Talk about a plot twist. By 2002, at 24 years old and almost a graduate, Venus was about to embark on another exciting adventure. Thanks to her friend Jamie, she was introduced to Jamie's brother, Doug Stewart, a charming Marine with a beautiful smile. Their first date? A fun movie night with a group of friends. And let's just say the sparks flew. Doug had the best description of Venus. Smart, articulate, and beautiful. And well, he meant what he said because they obviously didn't waste a minute. Just four days after their first date, they tied the knot. What in the history of fast military marriages is that about? Listen, if you're listening to this episode and you and your boo married within a week of meeting, please send me your love story. I would love to read about it. And who knows, I might share your love story or maybe your not so lovey story, depending on how it ended, on my next Tales from the Trenches. Anyway, and so it begins. But... How do you tell your parents that you married a guy you just met? Not really sure how Venus got the nerve to tell her parents, but they would later tell Dateline that they felt blindsided. They didn't know what to think. But Venus's brother liked Doug. He was outdoorsy and they often got to go hunting and fishing together. Well, after a year of being a military wife, Venus encouraged Doug to leave the Marine Corps. And in 2003, Doug did. Together, they moved to Schoolcraft, Michigan, not far from where they both grew up. Venus found a job at a bank, and Doug worked at an Applebee's and Pizza Hut. A year after moving to Michigan, the Stewarts began adding members to the family. First came a daughter in 2004, and a second daughter in 2006. Venus was making more money at the bank, so it made financial sense for her to return to work and for Doug to stay home with the girls while he looked for better employment opportunities. Instead, though, Doug took a particular liking to video games. 
I mean, who wants a real job when you can play video games all day? This created a serious rift among the young couple. Venus was out busting her ear while her husband was home, yeah, taking care of the kids, but then he'd reportedly play games such as Call of Duty and Halo for 6 to 10 hours per day. Doug's Xbox Live became his life, and he built many friendships through the internet. Venus, of course, complained to her mother, who believed that Doug was very immature. As the couple worked through their issues, Venus began to feel like maybe they just needed a change of scenery. Doug agreed, and the couple just put their heads together to figure out where in the world they would go. Their options all centered around theme parks. Williamsburg, Virginia had Busch Gardens. Miami, Florida was near Disney. Houston, Texas, well, they had SeaWorld and Six Flags. Ultimately, the couple settled on Newport News, Virginia. But guess what? The change of scenery changed absolutely nothing. And before long, Venus and Doug were down each other's throat. And now, without the support of family. One night, Doug returned home from doing who knows what, and no one was home. His kids, gone. Wife, gone. Dog, gone. Doug freaked out and he called the police to report everyone missing. The cops, well, they actually knew exactly where Venus and the kids were. You see, earlier that day, she had paid a visit to the police station to file a complaint against her husband. As reported by CBS News and police reports, Venus filed a complaint alleging that Doug had physically abused her and sexually abused their daughters. Well, I'm not sure what went down with the Newport News police, but they informed Venus at some point that they would not be investigating her claims. And Venus said, F this nonsense. My words, not hers. And she took her five and two-year-old daughters and the dog and returned to Michigan. Venus was officially done with Doug. The Daily Beast did some digging and they found that prior to Venus's disappearance two years before, Venus had filed for a protective order against Doug, writing, quote, I am scared to death and every day I live in constant fear and I am constantly looking over my shoulder wondering when he will appear again, end quote. In that complaint, Venus allegedly claimed that Doug threatened to take the kids away. Of course, in learning more about Venus and her tumultuous relationship with Doug, authorities kept turning their sights on the husband. Venus went missing while in Michigan, and while her ex had been made aware of her disappearance, he made no efforts to participate in any searches for Venus. In fact, Doug told Wood TV that he was getting very worried and concerned. He said, quote, I don't know what is next, to be honest with you. I'll just keep watching the news and pray and hope for the best, end quote. But while talking to Dateline, Doug was on another vibe. Doug actually believed that even though Venus fought and won full custody of the kids in court, well, according to him, the pressure of being a single mom and doing it all alone put a lot of pressure on her, and he felt she crumbled under the pressure and, quote, pulled another fast one. She ran off, couldn't handle the commitment of the situation she was in with the children by herself, end quote. Doug especially felt it was plausible since Venus had vanished before. Remember that time in Virginia when she left with the kids and the dog? I mean, it's not the same, but in Doug's head, it was the same. Despite the fact that Doug had an alibi for the day that Venus disappeared, no one was convinced he wasn't actually somehow involved. So in May, Michigan detectives paid Doug an impromptu visit in Virginia. They just popped on by. They didn't come alone, though. They brought a forensics team with them. Investigators chatted with Doug, and Doug was so sure he had nothing to do with Venus's disappearance that he allowed investigators to search his apartment, seize his computers, and even allowed them to search his truck. Clearly, he was a man with nothing to hide. While looking through the truck, investigators noted two things. One, his truck was filthy, but among the filth was a Walmart receipt. When they looked at the Walmart location, it was a Walmart located in Ohio, just two and a half hours from where Venus was staying when she went missing. Well, what business did Doug have in Ohio at Walmart just hours surrounding his wife's disappearance? And what could he have possibly purchased at Walmart? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Walmart receipt showed that the person purchased a tarp, a shovel, gloves, and a hat. And the purchase was made the night before Venus was last seen. Now, investigators started wondering if Doug possibly had an accomplice in Virginia who helped Doug appear to be in two places at once. A detective went down to Doug's attorney's office in Newport News to ask the two receptionists more specific questions about Doug. 
Particularly, they wanted a description of the man who showed up to pay Doug's bill. Well, the front staff said uh, the guy who came in to pay Doug's bill was wearing a hat, mirrored glasses, so we couldn't really see his eyes, and he was wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hood pulled over his head. They admitted that they weren't 100% sure it was Doug. Oh, and another thing they remembered, Doug didn't make eye contact, he didn't speak to them directly, and he left quickly after paying without taking his receipt. Although a far ways from a silver bullet, authorities felt they were one step closer to poking a giant hole in Doug's alibi. Well, once Venus was reported missing, the Stewart girls were placed with their grandparents in Michigan. Although my sources don't specify a time frame, at some point after Venus's disappearance, Doug moved out of his Newport News apartment and he returned to Michigan. Then one day, Larry, Venus's dad, got a call from Newport News. It was Venus's old landlord. I guess Larry had been listed as an emergency contact. Anyway, the landlord wanted Larry to know that once Doug vacated the premises, he left a lot of items behind, including the girls' toys and family pictures. The landlord felt bad throwing them out without first offering them to the family. Larry agreed to pick them up. It might be the last photos that he would have of his daughter if she was never found. While visiting the apartment complex to grab the items, Larry met a lot of Venus's prior neighbors who heard about Venus's disappearance. They told Larry that they really enjoyed Venus and the girls, but honestly, they could care less for Doug. Then Venus's grandfather received a call from someone claiming to be Venus. The person claimed that Doug had nothing to do with her leaving, but that was it. Eventually, the call was determined to be a hoax, or maybe Doug was behind the call. Back in Michigan, Doug attempted to regain custody of his children, claiming their mother had abandoned them. During the custody hearing, Doug was denied custody and even denied visitation with the girls. Custody was given in favor to Venus's parents in her absence. And this did not make Doug happy. As Doug maintained his innocence, authorities dug deeper and they obtained Doug's phone records, hoping to see something that might give them a lead. And then, as they were scrolling the phone bill, something popped out at them. There was continuous calls to and from one particular number beginning four days prior to Venus's disappearance. Then, both phones were turned off, and then the calls from that same number started back up again after the phones were turned back on. Investigators discovered the phone number belonged to a 20-year-old college student named Ricky Spencer. Ricky lived in Bear, Delaware with his parents. He had a clean record, his dad owned a vet clinic, and by all accounts, Ricky had a good relationship with his parents and siblings. Armed with his cell phone records, eight weeks after Venus went missing, investigators paid a surprise visit to Ricky. When investigators arrived, they were surprised at how much Ricky resembled Doug. They asked Ricky if and how he knew Doug, and Ricky revealed that they met online through Xbox Live a year and a half earlier. When investigators asked if they had ever met in person, Ricky said, yeah, they met that year for the first time during spring break, beginning on April 1st, 2010, when Doug invited Ricky to stay at his place in Newport News. Ricky said that they hung out and played games and they attempted to go out to the bars, but that was uneventful since Ricky was not 21 yet and couldn't get in. Ricky agreed that the visit was a little odd because Doug was so much older than him, but what bonded them together was their love for Xbox games. Ricky said he was there for a week and then he left and that that was the last time he saw Doug. Well, investigators had seen the phone records and although both Ricky and Doug's phones were turned off at the same time, at one point, Ricky's phone was briefly turned on and when it turned on, it pinged near Doug's apartment. When detectives asked Ricky if he knew anything about Doug's wife, he said that he recently heard that she had gone missing, but he didn't know anything about that. The investigators were like, well, just so you know, we are aware that Doug abducted his wife and killed her. And they also knew that someone helped Doug impersonate himself by dropping off payment for a lawyer's bill. Ricky was like, well, it wasn't me. In fact, he claimed to have even stopped talking to Doug after that awkward spring break trip. Through their investigative techniques, eventually they got Ricky talking. But all Ricky would initially say was that Doug told him he needed to go to Michigan to take care of business, specifically to see his wife and get rid of her. Ricky admitted that he went to Newport News and posed as Doug, both at his apartment complex and at the legal office, to offer an alibi for Doug. 
but Ricky swore he didn't know Doug was going to kill anyone. With this new information, authorities had enough to arrest and charge Doug. Venus was declared dead and Doug was arrested. During his arrest, Doug continued to say that his wife was playing a cruel, cruel joke on him. Welcome to our home. It's maybe a bit long to spend with people we barely know. This Friday, I guarantee you won't want to leave. Speak No Evo is filled with teeth clenching, seat clawing suspense. Something's not right with him. I've always wanted a family like yours. James McAvoy will scare you speechless. No! We are going to kill us. We're just sad to see you go. Speak No Evo. Rated R. Under 17, not admitted without parent. Only in theaters Friday. In February of 2011, in the town of Centerville, Michigan, Doug's trial for premeditated first-degree murder kicked off, sending ripples of shock through the community. As the charges unfolded, Doug found himself bewildered, pleading not guilty and insisting that there must have been some colossal mistake leading to his arrest. Surely, he thought, he would soon be free and perhaps even receive an apology. As the courtroom drama began, state trooper Stizma took the stand for the prosecution, sharing insights about the evidence collected at the scene, as well as the nature of Doug and Venus's relationship. He vividly recalled arriving at the scene to find Therese, Venus's mother, in a state of near hysteria, repeatedly crying out, he took her. Larry and Therese took the stand next, patiently describing Venus as a devoted mother who would never leave her children alone painting a picture of a caring and responsible woman who adored her kids. A Walmart employee added a splash of intrigue to the proceedings, recounting a memorable encounter with Doug during a chilly visit to an Ohio store. She vividly remembered his unusual choice of attire, Hawaiian flowered swim trunks paired with a mismatched shirt, quite the standout ensemble for the season. The jury was treated to surveillance footage from Walmart showcasing Doug wandering the aisles and meticulously selecting his purchases, a hat, gloves, a tarp, and a shovel. Another witness from the lawn and garden section of Walmart noted Doug's peculiar outfit as well, recalling how he had asked about lime, only to learn it wasn't in stock. When it was her turn to identify Doug in the courtroom, the woman seemed to tremble in fear, managing to say, I remember his eyes more than anything else. Now, let me stop here. Have you ever stopped to wonder how terrifying it must be to be swept into a murder trial just by the nature of your employment? Like you're just living your life, minding your own damn business when you find out you were the checkout person for a murderer who is now at trial. I mean, that is terrifying. And what happens if they're actually guilty but get acquitted? Do you have to live life looking over your shoulder wondering if this person is going to come after you? I mean, that's super stressful. Okay. Perhaps the most damning piece of evidence presented at Doug's trial, though, was a fingerprint found on the tarp wrapper in the McCombs yard, conclusively linking Doug to the crime scene. Why would his fingerprints be there? Unless, of course, he was the one who took Venus. But it was their star witness who single-handedly destroyed Doug's alibi. Ricky Spencer testified that he and Doug were like brothers. During the spring break visit, they bonded over amusement park outings and Xbox games, living it up as best buds. However, the narrative took a darker turn when Ricky divulged how Doug had convinced him that Venus was abusing their two daughters, a stark contrast to the trial testimonies confirming her loving nature as a mother. In an even more shocking revelation, Ricky described how Doug had recruited him to help fabricate a false alibi, planning for Ricky to impersonate him in Virginia while Doug traveled back to Michigan to carry out the alleged crime. As the trial unfolded, the tensions grew, each piece of testimony weaving a complex tapestry of allegations and relationships as the court held its collective breath, waiting for the truth. On the stand, Ricky Spencer provided a detailed account of the elaborate murder plan that Doug had concocted. According to Ricky's testimony, he would stay at Doug's apartment, cleverly utilizing Doug's credit card key fob, and even his wardrobe to create the illusion that Doug had never left Virginia. Meanwhile, Doug would make the long drive to Michigan, steering clear of toll roads, paying for gas with cash, and keeping communication with Ricky under wraps by using prepaid cell phones. However, Doug's scheme hit a giant snag right from the start. 
when he purchased a prepaid phone using a credit card, which generated an electronic receipt. This receipt didn't just show his purchase, it recorded the unique ID of the phones, making it all too easy for investigators to trace Doug's every move. Oh my word, I love this so much for this idiot. Thanks to GPS technology, Doug's whereabouts became almost as clear as if he were carrying a conventional cell phone. Two long years after Venus's mysterious disappearance, her Aunt Mary was still at the forefront of the search efforts, tirelessly leading volunteer groups each weekend in hopes of finding her niece. Because remember, even though they're at trial for Venus's murder, her body has never been found. The areas they scoured were strategically chosen linked to the records of cell phone calls made by Doug Stewart back in April of 2010. While Doug thought he had outsmarted the system by using track phones that he believed to be untraceable, law enforcement still managed to map out a trail of activity based on phone tower locations. This pinpoint information became a crucial element in the investigation offering a timeline that would eventually play a vital role in the unfolding courtroom drama. Ricky continued with his testimony. On April 15th, the stage for betrayal was set when Ricky and Doug met at a gas station in Bethesda, Maryland. With a sense of urgency, Doug handed over his clothes, cell phone, apartment keys, car keys, and even a credit card to Ricky, who was about to step into the life of his friend. Doug then departed for Michigan casually stating that he needed to, quote, take care of business, while Ricky returned to Virginia seamlessly unaware of the gravity of the situation. Surveillance footage played for the jury captured Ricky seamlessly slipping into Doug's life, driving his car, sporting his clothes, and even using his credit card for a quick meal at Wendy's. This bizarre charade led many to ponder whether Ricky truly understood the seriousness of their actions or if he simply viewed it as a twisted game. As the trial continued, Ricky revealed chilling details of Doug's intentions, which made it clear that Ricky knew exactly what Doug was planning to do. Ricky testified that Doug's plan involved strangling Venus and burying her in a predetermined location. However, Doug's initial attempt to carry out the plan hit a snag when an Ohio trooper pulled him over during his drive to Michigan. The traffic stop proved to be a blip in Doug's alibi that he was in Virginia. So, after the stop, Doug called Ricky and told him he needed to add a day to his trip. Ricky hesitated, reluctant to proceed with something that already made him uncomfortable. Doug's pressure, however, was relentless. He made it clear that if Ricky didn't help him, he would resort to violence against everyone. Venus, her parents, and all adults in the house, sparing only his children. Reluctantly, Ricky found himself ensnared in Doug's web. In a moment of raw honesty, Ricky recounted Doug's words to the jury, quote, He was telling me, like, I talked to my dad already about this, and you know, my wife is physically and mentally hurting my kids. If I wasn't 100% sure that my kids were going to be injured or killed by my wife, and if I didn't do anything and find out one day that they're injured or dead, that I will go on a rampage, end quote. The courtroom fell silent as the weight of Doug's words and the extent of his plans sunk in, amplifying the tension and disbelief of those present. What had begun as a reckless scheme spiraled into a dark narrative that blurred the lines between an Xbox friendship and betrayal. And the thing about Doug's rampage is that it included a slew of people, lawyers, prosecutors, jurors, which made everything even more scary. Doug's defense attorney was mortified by this discovery, and they immediately asked for a mistrial, stating that allowing the jury to continue after hearing this testimony would create fear in them that basically the defendant had threatened their lives. But the judge denied the motion for mistrial, instead agreeing to give the jury a special instruction. After that moment of shock and awe in the courtroom, Ricky continued describing the day of the actual abduction. Early on the morning of April 26, Doug called Ricky with precise instructions. He should show up at the law office between 8 and 8.15 a.m. Anything later just wouldn't cut it. Doug was insistent that Ricky speak to the secretary that he referred to as, quote, not all there in the head, end quote. Doug told Ricky to hand over an envelope, claim he was in a hurry, and then make a swift exit. After giving these peculiar instructions, Ricky was to wait for Doug's call. 
Just before 9 a.m., Doug called Ricky, and the shocking news he delivered left Ricky momentarily speechless. It's done, Doug announced, prompting Ricky to ask incredulously what he meant. Doug explained that he had called Venus's parents' house, masquerading as a mailman, to say that she had a package waiting outside. After learning what Doug was capable, Ricky now feared for his life. Later in the day, after Doug made his return trip home, Doug and Ricky met up to exchange clothes, keys, phones, and Doug's credit card. And in a moment tinged with dark humor, Ricky asked Doug if he was going to kill him too. No, Doug replied, to which Ricky sighed in relief and quipped, good, because that would suck. As they chatted, Ricky struggled to articulate the jarring details that followed, his emotions running deeper than Doug's stoic courtroom demeanor. Ricky recalled what Doug told him about the day's events. Doug recounted how he had physically confronted Venus, jumping out to surprise her only to be met with a terrified scream. She fought back, but Doug managed to place her in a headlock. He casually mentioned a drop of blood that had come from her nose, as if it were, I don't know, like an insignificant detail. Ricky, grappling with the gravity of the situation, asked Doug if it was worth it, and Doug asserted that it was absolutely the right thing to do, claiming he was protecting his kids and giving them some semblance of a future. With chilling ease, Doug then told Ricky he would call him later. He was planning to bury the body. The gravity of his actions hung in the air, but to Doug, the justification felt clear, leaving Ricky to grapple not only with the horror of what had transpired, but also with the realization of the man he had aligned himself with. After the prosecution rested their case, it seemed like a pretty open and shut case. But Doug's defense was not going down without a fight. During the trial, the defense leaned heavily on a central argument. Without a body, there was no conclusive evidence that Venus Stewart was truly dead. This case is what we refer to as a no-body case. The defense contended that it would be foolish for Doug to make significant purchases at Walmart, including a shovel, if he had just committed a murder or was just committing a murder. After all, who would be so careless? The defense further pointed out the lack of witnesses in Michigan, asserting that no one, no one had seen Doug there let alone witnessed him harming Venus, and she allegedly vanished in the morning. Who would abduct someone in broad daylight? The defense particularly took aim at the prosecution's star witness, Ricky. Ricky's credibility was shot. They portrayed him as a man whose testimony was tainted by a sweetheart deal. They argued that Ricky's agreement to testify against Doug in exchange for a lesser charge allowing him to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit manslaughter instead of facing potential prison time for murder, made him a dubious witness at best. After skillfully cross-examining Ricky, the defense chose not to call any witnesses of their own, resting their case on the idea that reasonable doubt remained in the case. Thus, their client would be found not guilty. <laughs> Despite their best efforts, after 12 days filled with evidence and three hours of intense deliberation, the jury returned with a conviction against Doug on both counts. At his sentencing hearing, the air was thick with tension as Venus's family continued to implore Doug to reveal the location of Venus's remains. Doug, still maintaining his innocence, turned to the family and called upon the police to keep searching, stating, quote, I asked police to continue looking for my wife. If not for me, my children need to know what happened to their mother, end quote. His words hung heavily in the room, a painful reminder of the unresolved mystery and the longing for closure that echoed through every corner of their lives. Doug was subsequently sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. As for Ricky, well, the defense was right. He did, in fact, receive a sweetheart deal. Ricky accepted a plea deal for conspiracy to commit manslaughter, which resulted in just a year in county jail. One year! Ricky's sentence sparked outrage for Venus's family, who felt that it was far too lenient. They believed, as do I, that Ricky had the chance to intervene and save Venus's life, a notion that weighed heavily on their hearts. In a moment of reflection, Ricky expressed deep remorse, stating, quote, it's a nightmare that I can never wake up from. 
I know that her family has to live with it for the rest of their lives. If there's any way that I could go back and change all of this, I would. And I would give my own life to bring her back so that she could be here for her kids and her family, end quote. His words lingered in the air, a haunting reminder of the lives forever altered by a chain of tragic choices. Following his conviction, Doug and his legal team launched an appeal, asserting multiple claims in hopes of overturning the decision. One of their primary arguments revolved around a supposedly inappropriate secret conversation that had taken place between the trial judge and the prosecutor, which the defense attorney claimed to have overheard. They insisted that this misconduct was serious enough to warrant disqualifying both the judge and prosecutor from retrial if a reversal were granted. Doug's lawyers also challenged the admissibility of testimony regarding Doug's threatening statements about going on a rampage if anything were to happen to his children. They argued that this testimony was prejudicial and should have led to a mistrial. Further complicating matters, the defense cited discovery violations involving a prosecution expert witness and contended that the testimony from that witness should have been excluded from the trial. They maintained that Doug was denied a fair trial when the judge rejected their motion to disqualify himself after the alleged ex parte communication with the prosecutor. Additionally, the attorneys alleged prosecutorial misconduct during the closing arguments, labeling the conduct as inappropriate and damaging to Doug's case. However, the appeals court, along with a subsequent federal habeas review, dismissed these arguments and upheld Doug's conviction. The courts determined that the issues raised had been appropriately addressed during the trial or were not significant enough to constitute constitutional violations that would warrant overturning the guilty verdict. Despite the legal battles, the verdict rang hollow for Venus's family. In a heart-wrenching expression of their grief, Therese lamented, quote, what good does it do? My daughter isn't here, end quote. Her words echoed the profound loss and the reality that, regardless of the trial's outcome, the pain of losing Venus would remain a heavy burden for her family to carry. And after the trial, the question remained, where was Venus? Would the family ever live in peace without properly burying their daughter? Would the kids ever get closure not being able to say goodbye to their mom? And well, just like in the case of Lacey Peterson, yeah, if you've been on Netflix lately or Peacock, you've seen that mess. Well, this case was very familiar. After the trial, Doug sat down for an interview with Dateline, expressing his disbelief at the proceedings and the lack of evidence surrounding his wife's disappearance. He stated firmly, quote, if you're hearing everything that I've heard, everything that I've seen, I still haven't seen anything showing me that my wife is hurt, that she's harmed, end quote. Now, I love me some Dateline because they don't shy away from the hard questions. And clearly they were like, what about Ricky's testimony, Doug? Doug seemed perplexed. Quote, I still don't understand his testimony on the stand. I mean, he got locations right as far as he came down. He was on spring break, end quote. Doug recounted that Ricky had called him on April 1st, mentioning he was on his way to visit and was almost at Doug's apartment. Almost where? Doug had asked to which Ricky responded, almost to your apartment. Despite the unusual circumstances, Doug felt comfortable enough to let Ricky stay with him, maintaining that he was not aware of any ulterior motives behind Ricky's visit. With conviction in his soul, Doug denied his actual convictions, asserting the idea of me hurting my wife or doing any of that stuff to my wife is very strange and very weird. None of that is true. Doug emphasized that his main reason for speaking to Dateline was the deep desire for answers about his wife's fate. Quote, at the end of this trial, I wanted to know what happened to my wife, where my wife is, if anything happened to my wife. I wanted answers and I didn't get them, end quote. Doug urged the police department not to close the case, insisting even though they believe it is, it's not. But despite what Doug thought about the investigation, investigators remained relentless in their pursuit of finding Venus Stewart, making actual visits to Doug at his new home in the unit at the Saginaw Correctional Facility. Each time, they held on to the hope that Doug would eventually come around and lead them to Venus's body. However, by 2015, Doug was still defiantly maintaining his innocence and exhibiting hostility towards the investigators. In their efforts, authority decided to revisit an old rumor concerning the possibility that Venus might have been buried beneath Doug's sister's barn. Doug's sister, eager to help clear her name, 
allow detectives to search the property with ground-penetrating radar, but their search yielded no results. So let's fast forward seven years after the trial, and Doug's outlook began to shift. His family had spent countless hours urging him to reveal Venus's location, and it seemed he was finally coming to terms with the reality of his situation. He was not going anywhere. In a surprising turn of events, Doug agreed to disclose the location of Venus's remains in exchange for several concessions. One, he wanted to teach in prison. Two, he wanted to join the canine program. Three, he wanted to be allowed to attend his parents' funeral when the time came. And four, he wanted to receive an Xbox for his prison unit. Chris Gotts, a spokesperson for the Michigan Department of Corrections, clarified that although the gaming console was donated for communal use, it wasn't connected to the internet, nor did it permit access to violent games. So you guessed it, Doug got exactly what he wanted. He got an Xbox. And it should be noted that in Dateline, they were saying that before Doug had even asked for the Xbox, there was already talks about them getting, like the Department of Corrections getting video games for the inmates. Finally, on October 22nd, 2018, eight years, five months, and 26 days after Venus's disappearance, Doug led investigators to Wakeshma Township in Kalamazoo County, showing them where he had buried Venus in a shallow grave. Two stumps marked the forlorn spot where Venus had been left all those years ago, wrapped in the blue tarp that Doug had purchased at Walmart. A dedicated team of detectives and Western Michigan University archaeology students worked together to excavate Venus's remains, marking a poignant moment in a long and painful investigation. Despite all those years where he played dumb and said he didn't do it, eventually Doug claimed he killed his wife for his daughter's sake, explaining, It finally hit a point where I wanted to tell my family. For the few years in prison, I think everyone has the same mindset. How do I become free again? The only way to do that is to maintain your innocence. And that entire time thinking of myself and how I could take care of myself has only led me to more pain and has caused more pain for my family and hers, especially Therese and my kids, end quote. When Doug finally made up his mind to tell the truth, he recounted the harrowing details of that fateful April morning when he ambushed Venus at her parents' home. He had laid in wait until she emerged then strangled her until she lost consciousness. Quote, I just sat there and looked at her with my best friend in my lap. I didn't have a plan, end quote. Despite his claims of spontaneity, Doug admitted that he had visited a wooded site hours before the confrontation. After Venus regained consciousness, Doug described how they argued again, leading to her eventual murder. Quote, I had plans for this to be the spot, he confessed, reflecting on the moment with a sense of disbelief. Quote, I don't know how I did it. I just can't believe I did it, he lamented. Detectives, while unsure of the veracity of Doug's statements, noted the chilling absence of remorse as Doug recounted the events leading to his wife's murder. In shackles, Doug led police to the exact location where they should dig for her remains. The recovery of Venus's remains took a day, and although it was a deeply emotional process, it provided a sense of closure for both investigators and family members who had spent nearly a decade searching for Venus. Quote, it was just really good after all that time to finally find her for the family, end quote. Soon after, the medical examiner's office utilized dental records to confirm the identity of the remains as those of Venus Stewart. In response, the Venus Foundation, the organization dedicated to finding missing people and founded in Venus's memory, issued a statement on Facebook expressing their relief at the discovery, but lamenting that it allowed Doug another opportunity for notoriety. Quote, we are happy the remains have been located, but saddened by the killer getting his additional 15 minutes of fame, end quote. The statement resonated as both a triumph of justice and a reminder of the profound loss suffered by those who loved Venus. Although Venus is no longer with us, her legacy lives on through her daughters. Therese spoke with News Channel 3 about the joy of raising her granddaughters, expressing, quote, The girls fill my life with joy. I mean, I can't be a happier grandmother than I am or mother. I feel like a mother because that's really what I am to them now. And you know, I have that happiness, end quote. Her words reflected a deep commitment to her family, shining a light on the love that filled their lives, 
amidst the shadows of loss. Trooper Aaron Stiesma, who was the first responder to Venus's disappearance, was recognized for his exceptional work and dedication with the Michigan State Police Meritorious Service Award. This prestigious honor is the highest accolade given by the department for excellence in criminal investigations. Stizma's meticulous crime scene response, thorough briefings for his fellow officers, and keen observations proved crucial in successfully prosecuting Doug Stewart. His professionalism and diligence underscored the integral role law enforcement plays in seeking justice. After eight long years, Venus was finally laid to rest alongside her father, Larry, who had tragically passed away just a year before Venus's remains were recovered. This bittersweet moment brought some sense of closure to the family, allowing them to honor her memory in a peaceful resting place. In honor of her niece, Venus's Aunt Mary founded the Venus Foundation, a nonprofit charity established in memory of Venus. The foundation is dedicated to supporting victims of domestic violence and their families, aiming to make a difference in the lives of those affected by similar tragedies. It was created as a response to Venus's tragic murder, striving to locate missing persons and provide vital assistance to individuals caught in the grips of domestic violence. Through this foundation, Mary channeled her grief into a mission of hope, ensuring that Venus's legacy would never be forgotten while helping others in the community. You can find more information about the Venus Foundation by visiting facebook.com slash Venus Foundation. The sad truth about today's case is that it reminds me of at least a half dozen cases that I have already covered. Remember Trisha Todd in Florida, Maribel Ramos, Andrine McDonald? And let's not forget about Kelly Cribs Abad and Nani Dotson who have never been found. I just want to remind everyone to stay safe out there. Thank you for listening today. And if you want to support the show, consider joining me on Patreon or Apple Premium, where for as little as $5 a month, you get to ensure not only that you get to listen to bonus episodes, but that this show stays on the air. Shout out to my girl Elizabeth for researching this episode for me. Military Murder is a Mama Margot production, executive produced by Myrtle, Jen, and Falcon 13. The theme music was created by Ty Ops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. I was working on her podcast. I don't want to.